see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. So, okay, let me just uh, get started here. Hi, it's Edwin Wright from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And I'm here uh, today to talk with Peter Zane. And um, thank you for uh, joining uh, me. Thank you so much. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. I, uh, I've watched a number of the videos that you've done uh, with the interviews, and uh, they're excellent and uh, very provocative and gave me a, a lot of things to think about. So it's an honor to be here. Oh, thank you for, for that. Uh, you're, uh, you're a journalist, and uh, you work at your teaching um, mass communication and journalism at St. Augustine right. College in, in Raleigh? Yes. I've, uh, I was, uh, I started my career in journalism uh, a year out of college, uh, worked at a twice weekly newspaper in Westchester County. I was born and reared in New York City, so I stayed close to home. Uh, I then worked for a travel trade magazine called the Travel Agent Magazine, uh, went to Columbia Journalism School, uh, because once you go to work for a trade magazine, it's hard to get back into legit journalism. So. Fortunately, my mother, who took an interest in me and was thinking about what would be good for me, said, hey, why don't you ever thought of going to graduate school? And I said, no. And she said, well, why don't you start thinking about going to graduate school? So I did. And it uh, was a terrific uh, experience. And uh, I, after that, uh, I ended up working at the New York Times. Uh, and I left there in 1996. Went to Ralph. It was that uh, my wife and I were going to have our first child, and the uh, two-room apartment that we were living in in New York for eighteen hundred dollars a month. Uh, we couldn't quite figure out how to put a uh, hammock up on the wall for the baby. It just wasn't going to work. So they said we need to get out of here. So we moved. I came down to Raleigh, where I uh, worked as the book review editor and books columnist uh, for the uh, Raleigh News and Observer newspaper, which. Uh, was and we can I can talk to you about editing and book reviewing, but obviously one of the great things about literature and being immersed in literature is it's in a lot of ways it's uh, the art of empathy, it's yeah. creating yeah. characters, getting inside somebody else's head, um, and uh, having them come to life. And so when you are reading a lot of books, you're spending a lot of time. Uh, you're by yourself but you're with lots of other people, with these characters that have been created by experts uh, to uh, make them come alive for you, for you to figure out who they are and where they came from. Yeah, so I think... And, and that's what we wanted to talk about, is how can we build a culture of empathy? And the, the way that I connected with you was I came across an article you had written uh, where you talked about empathy. It was called The Lost Art of Empathy. And yes. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. Um, just... I can also show, as you saw, you know, articles and so forth, uh, you know, uh, web um, screenshots. And it starts off by you say, empathy is particu particularly useful in political d debates because it helps us find common ground to see a little bit of ourselves in the opponents. So, you know, when I was reading that, I thought, hey, this is really great because this is, you know, this is about how do we bring empathy into the larger um, you know, into the political debate. So right. uh, can you, would you like to just review your article, just kind of what you wrote? And, and actually, how well, did you even get to, how did you even come up with the idea to start writing about this? Well, it, it, it came from uh, two things. Um, one was that I have heard these repeated calls for civility in public discourse. Uh, they often occur after someone says something completely outrageous, whether it's Rush Limbaugh or Bill Maher uh, or a host of other people, uh, we then force them to make a phony apology. Um, and a phony apology, I guess, is better than no apology at all. But it got me thinking that, one, what a low bar we set when what we want to do is just have people be civil to each other. To me, being civil is when, when that's your standard, it's, you, you act civil when you want to punch somebody in the nose. Uh, when you don't respect who they are or what they have to say, and you kind of bite your lip. Uh, that, to me, is how I understand civility. Empathy, on the other hand, uh, is about respect and dignity. I think that when you practice empathy, when you recognize somebody else's humanity, um, 
acting civilly towards them uh, comes naturally because you you are respecting them as another human being trying to draw upon their life experience and their understandings of the world to make sense of things. It doesn't make, mean you agree with them, uh, but at least it means that you see that common struggle. Um, yeah, now, so they, so they empty, I mean, so the civility can be like, you know, I really don't like you, you're, you're a jerk, you're an idiot, but I will act. It's kind of like this layer on top to uh, just kind of act, uh, you know, not aggressive or whatever. Whereas um, the empathy is really like a deeper connection, a deeper seeing. Exactly. And, and I just think in our public discourse, the calls of civility, uh, for civility, come out of one, you know, I think it's a recognition that we've handed over a lot of the discourse to extremists, to people who say outrageous things, uh, who we have to have some break on what they're trying to say. And it doesn't leave a lot of room for the great mass of us uh, in the middle who I don't think are extremists, but when you live in an extreme culture, you start to think that way. Uh, or you start to phrase things in that way, or you're not recognizing other people's humanity uh, in, in a wider discourse because that's not what you come across all the time. And I think that we are terribly affected by the environment around us. Um, so I don't have a problem you know, with the idea of civility per se, uh, but what I'm saying is the way that it is being used now is something that doesn't make us get to know each other better. It's simply saying, when you're being rude, you can only be rude up to this certain mm, point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and one of the lines that I had when I uh, was writing that piece that I erased, I originally was going to say, every good parent knows that it's not enough to say you're sorry. What do you say to the kid? Tell me why you're sorry. Um, so when people say things that are not civil, and then we demand an apology of them, we never go to that next part of the conversation, which is, why did you say that? Why does that make sense to you? And what do you know now uh, that leads you to recognize that what you said was wrong? And, it, and if it's wrong just because it hurts somebody else's feelings, that's not a very good reason. Uh, that's sympathy, maybe. Yeah. Empathy is, you know, it's wrong because I cast somebody uh, as being less less uh, entitled to uh, respect and dignity. Um, so that was, that was one aspect of it. I'll tell you the other aspect um, of where the piece came out of is I teach uh, a writing class at St. Augustine's College in Raleigh. And one of the things that we do for freshmen is they have to do a, a basic speech. And so we want to just get them into what research methods are, uh, ways of organize, organizing your research and so forth. So we, in this class, I have them pick an issue, a contentious issue, abortion, uh, death penalty, voter ID law, something like that, that they're going to investigate. And I want them to give the side for and the side against. Okay, so you have two paragraphs for, two paragraphs against, just to learn how to do this. Well, one of the things that I realized is that I was sort of setting up this Manichaean, mm. this sort of Darwinian thing where there's one side and the other side. And I said, I don't want you to think of it that way. I want you to think of it as both sides probably have a good bit of logic on, uh, 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 on their side, which is why lots of people are for the issue or against it. OK. And when we decide to come down on each side, what we're doing is, is that we are creating a balance among competing values. And so what I want you to do is to not just look at polar opposites, to see things as polar opposites, because that's not how things truly are. Now, the most things truly are is there are things we like on both sides, but we come down on one side or the other based on our life experiences or whatever. So when you then in the next phase of the writing go to do a persuasive speech, uh, where you choose a side, you're going to have to address the people who disagree with you. And I want you to have some sense of like why their view not only makes sense to them, but makes sense to you on some level. And that way is the road, I think, to begin to uh, practice empathy and to inhabit as much as you can somebody else's mind is to see in yourself um, a little bit of them, where that common ground comes from. 
So the, that seems like there was two parts then to your article. One is was the civility, and I think the most recent uh, dialogue about civility came after the Gabby Gifford shooting, if I'm correct. I mean, that was the really intense. Then it's kind of like died down since then. And the other is that uh, there tends to be this uh, dia this uh, way in, of competitive dialogue in terms of of uh, debate. Right, my side, your side, but then you even can turn it. Well, I'll stand in your in your side and debate that. And you just get really good at that debate, whatever side you're you're at. And so, what you're wanting to do is kind of get past that competitive debate to really everybody uh, seeing each other, kind of the deeper aspects within uh, the other person. Which I is which is empathy, right? It's like you. It's replacing competition with uh, empathic connection. I, I want to get past it because it's false. Okay, I mean, any issue you take, a, abortion. You know, does anybody here not want to uh, uh, have people determine their fate and what their lives are going to be? I.e., you know, women should have control of their bodies and control of their destiny. Of course. On the other hand. Do, do people uh, believe that we should just take innocent life? Very few people believe that. Uh, now, how you balance those two things uh, will help decide where you come out on that issue. Um, I think that there's things on you know each side that, that are appealing to us. Um, the death penalty, uh, you know, we want security uh, and we want fairness and liberty how do we balance that's what the criminal justice system is it's all about how do we balance our need for security uh and then the uh right of people to engage in certain conduct and what should we allow them to do or not um and and i think that when you start seeing things at that fundamental level it's it it, it provides you an entree um into uh these the, the complexity of these ideas um and the idea that they uh complement each other. Uh, I'll give you one other example, um, which I don't want to get too far straight, but I've written a book with a professor at Duke named Adrian Bejan called Design and Nature. And one of the key points that he makes in this book is that uh, everything in nature, uh, not that there's, not that raindrops have an urge or lightning bolts do, but that they act in their self-interest. And his theory is, is that things move in their, that, that things want to move more easily across the landscape. So that raindrops uh, form river basins, lightning bolts, uh, electricity in the cloud forms lightning bolts, uh, and on and on it goes uh, in order to move more easily. And the way that they pursue their self-interest to move more easily is by coalescing, by coming together. And so we'll just take a step back. And I said too often in American, in our dialogue, uh, there's you're pursuing your selfish interest or you're uh, for community and cooperation. Well, first of all, everybody pursues their selfish interest and everybody to some level cooperates with people and is a member of the community. So it's false to begin with to have those be dichotomous. I'm not saying that there isn't tension between them, but that in living, we resolve these things one way or the other. Some people balance one thing more than another. But look at issues as uh, either or, good or evil. Um, it's not, that's not how life is. It simplifies things too much, in my opinion. Well, that's what uh, one of the things that interests me in, in what you wrote is I, I've looked at uh, journalism in, in general. And at the worst case, journalism is our actual disputants. Take Fox and MSNBC. They're actual right. disputants. They're like in kind of this battle. Uh, then you take uh, like NPR or something, and they're kind of like uh, fight promoters. It's like we will we will be the referee holding the space for the two of you to kind of duke it out at a civil at a civil level kind of right and so that's the level then there's actually kind of moving towards more like i would say the empathic level which is where as a journalist i mean i, I envision that journalism could you know transform to being more like uh mediators 
doing what uh, conflict mediation is all about, which is uh, in a conflict, there's two disputants, people really pissed off at each other, they can't understand each other, they're calling each other's names, they're demeaning each other, um, you know, they feel hurt and in pain. And with conflict resolution, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of different forms of it, but one form is you empathize with both sides. I hear what you're saying. Are you saying this? Is this right. what you're saying? And that takes their level of pain down because somebody's hearing them in, in this. And you do it to both. And then you get the sides to turn to each other. And then you kind of help mediate this empathic connection. And there's a whole kind of art to that as well. And as, as the disputants kind of get to know each other and really start seeing kind of these, this deeper aspect of, you know, you know, as you're saying, maybe uh, uh, abortion or any of these really, you know, contentious uh, topics, right. you really feel, you know, deeply what it is that the other person is feeling. And you start taking that in and as you were saying, see it in yourself as well. That it creates, you know, maybe the word is healing, that that rift is, is brought together into a connection. And from there, there's a, uh, um, uh, what I would call empathic action, which is taking action together to, you know, to uh, create and transform the world. So that would be my ideal of transforming all of journalism to be actual mediators who have that skill of, you know, going in deeply and assisting all the sides. Um, and, and now, and that's like an empathy-based uh, journalism versus a competitive base. Because right now we have the ideas, if we compete, the best idea, the truth will kind of emerge somehow. Um, so that's kind of, I'm just wondering how that kind of resonates. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that probably in the competition of ideas, the better ideas will win out. So I accept that. I'd say that uh, uh, putting aside the uh, pressures on modern journalism to make things easy, to make them intelligible for people to write stories, uh, you know, four stories a, a week, uh, we'll put that aside. We'll put aside you know, which is a huge issue. And I would say with uh, MSNBC and Fox that oftentimes it's not just that they're biased, although some of the people on their stations clearly are, but it's that they see the world in different ways. What's a story to Fox News? It's not that Fox News lies. It's that what Fox News sees as a story may not be what MSNBC sees as a story. Uh, and then someone could take a step back and say, well, they're giving us a distorted view of the world by only telling us about a little sliver of things that are going. I mean, in other words, it's, it's terribly complex. Uh, a lot of these calls for um, journalists to, uh, you know, oh, well, we're just going to tell the truth and we're doing fact checking. And uh, when you look at the fact checks that are being done now by the Washington Post or the Tampa Tribune, these other places, biases can't help but creep in. We have a perspective. We have values that we bring to these discussions. Um, and I think we have to be aware of that. Uh, and I think where journalism has moved away from, and I don't know that it was ever practiced this way, to be honest, but what the ideal is supposed to be, is what we're supposed to do is go and listen to people and try to understand them as they truly are. I mean, one of the, the reason I got into the business was you get to sit down and talk to the most interesting people in the world about the thing that makes them interesting. And whether that's somebody who is running a company or a famous writer or somebody who's been struggling with a disease, but you're meeting with people and getting to talk to people who have uh, accomplished something or experienced, in, experienced something that's a little bit out of the ordinary and get to figure out who they were, what it meant to them, how that changed them. You live through their experience in some way. Um, and I think that because of uh, the demands of the market, because of the changing uh, uh, makeup of American society, perhaps, but uh, that's very hard work and it takes a lot of time. Mm. And uh, 
uh, you know, the competitive pressures and the uh, need to churn stuff out means people have less and less time to do that kind of work. Um, yeah, so that the, the empathic listening uh, and kind of going deeper and having that sense of presence, I mean, it takes time. It takes, uh, it takes a lot of time. And so journalism itself is caught up in this competitive system. And so there's less and less time for that. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that we, we have a very moral culture. It's a weird thing about the United States is that, and, and well, oftentimes what happens is people say things that are extremely interesting uh, and provocative, but especially in politics, and they get shouted down, okay? So Rick Santorum uh, was talking about contraception, and, and his basic point was that contraception uh, has not been uh, wholly a blessing for American society. Um, and immediately that got turned into, oh, he, he wants to take contraception away from people. And that's not what he was saying. He's actually making a really interesting point. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong, but from his perspective uh, about how uh, contraception has changed sexual mores, uh, in his mind, perhaps it has uh, uh, led to uh, out-of-wedlock births. Um, it's, it has, in some ways, the Brookings Institute study uh, from 1996, I believe, said that uh, the rise of the pill in some ways made women responsible for pregnancy. If a woman got pregnant, uh, it was, quote, her fault, um, and it gave men the freedom to not take the responsibility uh, that in the past, when a woman got pregnant, buy a gun wedding. You know, and 30, 40 percent of weddings back in those innocent days were due to pregnancy. Mm. Um, but we shut that discussion down. Or when Hillary Rosen recently said Ann Romney's never worked a day in her life. You know, it, 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 all it became was this discussion about why did she say that and who's got a war on women and so forth. When it actually would have been a great time for us to say, geez, why do you think that? How do you see um, work and fulfillment for women. Let's have a, uh, you know, remind you of both Hillary Clinton, well, I wasn't going to stay home and bake cookies, or in the movie, The Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher said, I'm not the kind of woman who's going to, you know, stay home and have teas. I want to have a life that has meaning. Okay. Now, that's not the truth of it. And people who don't, women who don't go to work and men who don't work outside the home have meaningful lives. But instead of having a conversation about how we truly feel about that and the choices that we've made, um, it, we shut down that discussion. And so we don't really know where Hillary, how she really feels about this issue. We don't really know what Rick Santorum was trying to say about contraception that could give us a, a broader way of looking at these things and weighing these issues. Uh, too often in journalism, uh, because of the calls of civility and gotcha journalism, and we want to make things easy, he's against contraception. She hates mothers. Uh, yeah, that's basically what we came up with. Um, and I think it's uh, the, the, the opposite of empathy yeah. it's the closed mindedness we're going to make we're going to make a judgment about this issue before we even talk to them to find out what they were trying to say yeah yeah so all those are kind of like the blocks to empathy it's like we have so many blocks here it's like <laughs> we've got the the civility you know is is kind of blocking it um you know the time is blocking it the competition is blocking it the kind of the morality of uh, cut it, sh cutting short conversations and not fully hearing what everyone has to say to the full extent that they want to be heard and seen. So there's all these things. It's like the, the culture is, I mean, there, there is empathy. I mean, I see it, but it's kind of oh, like, yeah. it's like, it seems like we need to ratchet it up. You know, we're kind of bouncing along at this low level of empathy. And I think all the things, what, what you're pointing out is what's kind of keeping it from being raised. And uh, I, it's like, do you and, see? And journalism, no, no, go ahead. journalism is a is a model for this. I mean, I'm just saying that. I mean, that's one of the we have to look for the public square. And what is the public square? Um, and it's often the internet and the television. And uh, I think people in their daily lives. I mean, one of the ironies is, and I don't know that if it's just empathy, 
but people today uh, are a lot nicer to each other than they, they ever have been. I mean, you just think about what American society was like 50, 60 years ago, before the civil rights movement, before the women's movement, before the gay rights movement. I mean, think of uh, the, the, how much more dignity and respect we have been taught to accord each other, or we have been allowed to accord each other. I mean, so I always think there's that other larger piece of the puzzle, and I don't know that that comes out of empathy, or, I mean, one of the things that was so striking to me was uh, during the Iraq and Afghan wars, um, and terrible things happened to the Iraqi and the Afghani people. But there was also, yeah, I would say, much more of a sensitivity on the part of Americans about civilian casualties. Uh, whereas you take a look at World War II and just the bombing of Dresden. I mean, we have, and so I would say that uh, short of a mortal peril, I doubt that the United States in the near future would engage in a war where we just indiscriminately killed civilians that we have in past wars. I, I think that we have evolved to a point of recognizing some basic dignity of other people that there's a line that we shouldn't cross. And I think we're a much better society on a very broad scale, even though uh, our public discourse, ironically and paradoxically, uh, uh, and again, I don't want to say it's done. We always like to think of the past as being better. I don't know what it was like in the past. I'm sure we were just as dumb back then. But I know we're smarter than our discourse is now. I know we're able to do more. And it's just disheartening that we don't. Yeah. Well, yeah, I put it in the terms of, of empathy, um, because I see that as the core, that all those things that you're talking about are kind of like levels. And it's not like we're, the empathy is on or off. It's, it's like there's these varying degrees and it fluctuates. And as we become more stressed, you know, that's something that pushes it down as we feel, as we judge or, or judge others, you know, it kind of goes down. So I'm kind of looking at, you know, how do we raise that uh, bar? And I, I mean, you brought up the war. I mean, in a sense, it's a bit of a failure of uh, empathy in the sense that, you know, I kind of see that instead of having a whole army of, you know, the military, how about having an army of mediators, right? right. They're going out right. and mediating. And how do we kind of, I guess I'm looking at it as uh, actually transforming society where, you know, there, there's uh, so much talk about freedom in, in the country. How do we change it? So we're actually like talking about empathy all the time, saying, how do we raise empathy? What can we do to create more I, I, empathy? Yeah, well, two things. One, I said, you know, as a journalist, we're like just not institution builders. You know, I kind of write something and somebody reads it and I hope it was I learned a lot writing it. I hope that it uh, affects other people. But uh, uh, I remember I, when I was working at the New York Times, I uh, wrote their neediest cases campaign one year. And I had the honor of working with uh, Arthur Gelb, who was a uh, legendary editor at the Times. And he was running their foundation. Uh, and he said, I got to tell you, I love the second career I have because now I actually get to make a difference. I actually get to get involved in causes that I think are important. Uh, and devote my energies to investing in things and building things. And the work of journalism was very important to me as well, but it was a, a different kind of animal. So one, I don't know uh, on that level. I, I would say that what, one thing I stress to my students, uh, and it gets back to that uh, false dichotomies that we too often, uh, you know, our, our thought centers on. I think that empathy is in your self-interest. And I tell them, uh, you should empathize with somebody because you should respect them and give them dignity and you want to know where they're coming from. But I say, when you practice empathy, you empower yourself because you are better able to uh, figure out who you're talking to, what they're saying, what they want. I mean, you can't change somebody's mind, whether it's to agree with you on a political issue or to buy the soap that you're selling unless you know what matters to them. Uh, and I think that one way that I would, you know, is, is to let people know that empathy is not just something that eggheads sit around talking about or, you know, people who are just sort of not involved in society. 
uh, trying with big ideas, I would say that it's a fundamental tool that everybody has to master uh, to have a rich, successful, and effective life. And if we can start getting teachers now and parents to think about this, um, to consciously and rigorously try to impress this upon young people, uh, and then ideally, and again, I think it's so difficult in the in our marketplace, but uh, you know, what I try to do, try to remind myself of, and it's hard work to remind myself of that, is to practice empathy in how I write, how I, you know, and, and, and what I say. And, and, and what's good about writing a piece like The Lost Art of Empathy is it makes me think twice before because we can have a natural reaction to just wag our finger at somebody or say, you're wrong, and not do the hard work to figure out where they're coming from. So for me, it sort of creates a little standard of uh, being better than I usually am, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that that's really crucial is uh, it, it, it's, it's empowering. Yeah. And it's in your self-interest so to people, not yeah. see it as... Well, people often see empathy as, well, that's wishy-washy or it's like, it's kind of like, being told just be good, just be empathic. It's like kind of a moralizing, uh, top-down kind of attitude. What you're saying, it's really uh, is what's going to give you a more fulfilling life. It's going to make you feel more connected, more fulfilled, uh, maybe even happier. And 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 I'm saying probably wealthier. Wealthier. I mean, probably the not everyone, but by and large, I bet you the more successful people. Um, are, are, are very good at empathy. That they, when they get into a meeting with somebody, they're not just think, thinking about what they want out of it. Their figuration is, right? That's what compromise is about. I think that's one reason why it's so hard for people to compromise now uh, in politics, uh, is that y you see two sides and neither one wants to give in because they're gonna look weak. And so what happens? Neither side gets anything and the problems just get worse. Well, for me, uh, the compromise that opens up a whole, there's all these things are connected, but uh, the, the uh, compromise for me is a little bit like civility in the sense that compromise is like, um, you know, I want this, you want that. And it's kind of like the sense of uh, our selfish interest. And we kind of negotiate to a kind of a line between. Whereas empathy is really, I'm seeing who you are, what it is that's important to you. You're seeing... And slowly we become sort of like one being in the right. sense that we we uh, consider the other person because they are part of us in that sense through through the empathic mirror neurons and all that uh, you know understanding. So um, I know conservatives are always against compromise. They say we will not compromise our values, and it's like a really you know firm thing. Here. And in a sense, I can understand where they're coming from there right. and it's not that we want to say no you should compromise your values it's let's let's go deeper let's go right. and have a deeper connection to where you're we're not actually compromising our values we're actually finding where our values are the same and building on that like if we value connection and empathy then we have a common we're not compromising our values we're kind of building on that foundation and it's like, well, I don't, and I, and I've, uh, you know, I've been to the Tea Party rallies. I've been to the Republican state convention. I've been to the Democratic conventions here, the local ones, California. Been to, uh, you know, the Occupy rallies. And my parents or family is conservative. I'm kind of more on the progressive side. So I, you know, I used to say, think, well, I got the, I have the right answers. But you know, as I've just kind of got more into empathy. I, I find it's more about listening to everyone. Right. Well, it, I think that's a terrific, really a, a wonderful uh, discussion of compromise. And I hadn't really thought about it that way, taking that next step. Uh, I'm curious if you're living outside of Berkeley and you're on the progressive scale. Well, what, where do you see common values uh, on an issue or two with conservatives that uh, might surprise uh, you know, people who uh, vote the way you do. 
Well, there's a couple, I mean, I've kind of moving away from progressive and conservative to, I know when I create the empathy party movement, <laughs> it's kind of like the media, it's like two people in conflict, the mediator who stands uh, right. not in the, not detached, but engaged in empathy for both sides. So um, when I went to the Tea Party rally, uh, what struck me was people were saying, we're not being heard. We're not being heard. We're not being heard. You, right. you go to the Occupy movement. We're not being heard. We're not being heard. So you're talking about a common value, which is everybody wants to be heard to the full extent of who they are. So do you think, though, that do you think that that's we're not being heard is uh, we're actually not being heard or we are uh, uh, not getting our way. Yeah. I mean, I, for instance, heard a lot of people who, uh, when we went to war in a Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, nobody listened to us. I think people, there was a full and vigorous discussion of the war. And, uh, you know, the person who decided heard all those arguments and did something else. And the American people actually, until the war started to go south, there was some uh, general support for the war, but without revisiting that issue, but it always struck me as the people who said, Our, nobody heard what we were saying. I heard them, I saw the marches in London and New York, there were huge anti-war marches before hostilities uh, began in Iraq. And uh, it's just, they didn't carry the day. And so I don't know how you, what, what do you think about yeah. getting people to accept living in a democracy that uh, being heard doesn't mean being followed um, and having them compromise uh, where you find that ability to say, I'm not going to get the result I want. Well, I, um, see, I see that played out kind of most intensively in restorative justice uh, type uh -huh. circle process, where in that process, everybody is heard and it goes on and on until everything is kind of brought out. Um, and some of these people are in terrible dispute and it's and it's finally people start seeing each other's humanity and they jointly create the the uh, new reality and they kind of negotiate they say well we'll meet on this and that time and we'll do this and i can't make this time but i'll try that time so it takes this whole process of uh, this right. whole empathic kind of uh, deepening process to kind of bring that connection to happen and then uh to kind of create the reality going forward. Um, I did have an experience with at the Republican convention, which I thought was for me kind of telling, is that, you know, they were, I, what? It was the state, a it was the state uh, convention that was here in California. And I went there and I said, I want to hear what Republicans have to say about empathy. And I went to the press office and they were very gracious and they said, you know, we're always seen as heartless, so we really appreciate what you're doing, coming here to right. kind of talk about empathy. And they actually introduced me around to talk to people. Um, then there was a couple of young Republicans who were kind of fraternity, you know, had the kind of uh, a attitude. And I said, well, right. tell me about your values. What's the most important value to you? And uh, he said, protection. Anybody hurt me and my family, and we're going to protect ourselves. So... I said, oh, so protection is important and kind of engaged in a dialogue about protection. And then it's like security is important. You know, I don't want people coming and robbing our house and, and that kind of stuff. But then I switched it saying, well, it sounds like you're concerned that there's people out in the world who are not going to empathize with you. Because if they're stealing from you, they're obviously right. not empathizing with you. And it's a yeah, I guess so. I guess empathy is important in right. the world. And I said, yeah, so we want to have people who aren't going to be taking advantage of you and who are empathizing with you, you know, because you're concerned and that's valid. I feel concerned too right. about being taken advantage of. So I can really, that protection and security really resonates with me. And in this case, it was really about uh, being afraid that there's people who are not going to empathize. So then I said, right. well, what can we do together to create more empathy in the world? Right. You know, and then we're on the same page. And then one of them, there was three young Republicans there. One of them pulled up uh, an iPhone or a smartphone. He says, 
I got to read you this, that a friend of mine, he was a real jerk, you know, just thought about himself all the time, um, you know, and uh, his mother was dying of cancer and she wrote him this letter. It was one of the last things she wrote and I have a copy of it and he read it and it was like, you know, dear son, it's so important that you care about other people because you'll see that that's really what's the most important, you know, in life. Right. And he said, this changed my friend's life. You know, he totally turned around. But what, but for me, it was, you know, it was listening to what was important. Right. And then seeing how it related to empathy or its lack. And then it turned out we both wanted people to be empathic. We wanted to have empathy, feel empathic, and that gave us a sense of security. And then this other person actually shared something very intimate, you know, this intimate letter. And uh, so I felt that's, that's right. Yeah, I mean, and really, I think a lot of what, what I'm getting out of that story is, uh, you, you know, oftentimes we just deal with people on a surface level. Yeah, we have our. Guard up. I want security. I want um, and that can make it challenging for us who are trying to practice empathy because one, this is the face that we're getting. And a lot of times you go, oh, I know what they're about or I don't want to deal with them. Uh, and to remind ourselves that this guy who you meet, who's originally quite rigid and whatever, is actually a human being who probably has many intimate experiences, poignant ones, painful ones, just like you did, that everybody has that. Uh, and that we're dealing with them on a surface level and we can't get to know every each and every person that we come across. But to remember that each and every person that we come across is as complex uh, and as, uh, uh, you know, it, it, as, it, as we are, is as complex as we are, for lack of a better word. And, and to see that in people, that there's a sort of a nimbus around them um, of humanity that often uh, gets hidden or diminished uh, because we're just dealing in day-to-day -day life and we just got to be quick. Here's what I think. This is what I want. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, the difficulty is in getting people to the face that they carry around in public and how they deal with things to get beyond that shorthand, to always be, you know, looking not to just give the because remember you know one of the things i also teach my students is you know the brain summarizes the brain is a machine the brain wants to be efficient it doesn't want to use a lot of energy and so it makes snap judgments about things malcolm gladwell in that book blink wrote all about that uh it wants to just deal with things and move on and empathy kind of this is what i would say that's also what makes it difficult uh, the empathy difficult because you've got to decide to expend the energy mm -hmm and do the work and i think that i'm not a psychologist so i don't know but from what i've just seen of human nature that's not the way the mind works unless you train the mind to say you know what if i invest a little more effort i'm going to get a lot more back and that's what i was saying about self-interest you've got to empathy requires more work more energy more thought uh, but you've got to believe that there's going to be a payoff for it uh, and a payoff that's beyond just, oh, well, now I'll understand this guy more. I think that that payoff will be useful to you. Um, but, you know, you had to spend time with those guys. How long did it take you before the kid showed the letter? Yeah, it was uh, maybe 20, 30 minutes of talking. I mean, I could have just judged because, because the, the protection part is kind of like, well, we've got to have guns. I mean, that's what it is. And then if you're progressive, it's kind of like, oh, guns, bad, you know, you're an idiot kind of thing. Right. So the judgments come in, they get kind of like just set off by these kind of, and it's really what is underneath that sense of wanting a gun, you know, or wanting right. protection. It's like, let's, let's, take, let's take some of the levels off and get down to where I can really see what it is that's important to you. And it turns out it's the same thing that's important to me. But the one part that I find it's missing, and that's what I'm trying to do at the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, is make the empathy more explicit. You know, the empathy, it's, it's, it's almost as if the air that we breathe, that we don't even seem to see it. And it gets kind of, um, you know, taken for granted. Right. And, right. Well, 
you, you know, I think again, part of it is the hard work. It's you ever go and you have a, you spend a lot of time and you have a really good, make a great meal and it's delicious. And you go, I should eat like this all the time. This is just, it tastes better. Mm. It's better <laughs> for me. And then the next night you just heat something up in the microwave. Um, and it's funny how people have a very positive experience when they actually practice empathy. Uh, they see how rewarding it is. They go, oh, my God, most discussions that I have with people are uh, boring. I mean, they don't say everybody, they, most people talk in cliches or they just tell you briefly what they did during the day or they'll spout a view that you've heard a thousand times before. I mean, that's just a normal discourse that people have. Uh, when you actually spend time and talk to people. And then we get into a whole discussion of, you know, the disappearance of people hanging out on their porches in many communities and, uh, you know, our car-based culture, all these ways where we don't sit and just talk to each other all the time. When I moved from New York City down to Raleigh in 1995, I had to learn a lot of the cultural mores. And one of them was that uh, when somebody was talking and they paused for more than four seconds, it didn't mean that they were fit to talk. Uh, it just, they were catching their breath. Mm -hmm. I also learned that when you said to somebody, hey, how you doing? They actually took that as a question and as an opportunity to engage in a conversation. I'm not saying everyone was deep or profound, but that there was much more of a culture, at least in the people that I was meeting, um, of talking and telling stories and sharing your experience. And so without getting... We, you know, we could write 10 million books on this, but I mean, probably that's, uh, you know, the lost art of conversation leads to the lost art of empathy, the fast pace of our culture, which probably plays into our brain's need to be efficient, to cut to the chase, to summarize things, you know, all act as breaks on our desire to practice empathy, um, which requires a lot of work. Uh, but on the other hand, as I said, when you do it, it's so rewarding and you don't realize why people don't do it more often. Well, that's one of the things I like to do is if you've seen some of the other interviews is ask about a metaphor for empathy. So, uh, you know, usually empathy is seen as standing in someone else's shoes, looking through someone else's eyes. And I don't know if that's your empathy, but empathy is like a, a well-cooked meal or do you have another metaphor? <laughs> I mean, my metaphor, I, for me, I am, uh, I'm not so sure about my own personal ability to see things through somebody else's eyes. Um, I think I can begin to understand who they are and where they're coming from intellectually. I don't know if I can do it emotionally. Uh, and I find that one of the ways that I connect with people, besides being curious about them and uh, you know, I think there's been a real diminishment in curiosity in this country, but being curious about other people to at least intellectually, abstractly know where they're coming from and how they think, and then where it becomes emotionally real for me, um, and this is just how I am, is when I can see a little bit of themselves in me, when I can see where, where I have a point where I can correspond with them, or even if I haven't been through that same experience that they have, I, I understand where they're coming from in that context. And I have a point of connection with them on that. Um, other people may, I, I can't draw, you know, I just cannot in three dimensions. Uh, I just can't do that. Um, so I, I can accept that other people have skills that I don't have. But for me to truly say, I really know where that person's coming from, especially if they haven't, if I haven't lived that, I don't, I'll never know what it's like to be a, a crack addict living in some, I'll, I'll know what it's like to be desperate for something and to want it, but whether that experience can be the same as that or what it's like to, uh, I remember being out in the uh, Eastern North Carolina, we have a lot of military bases. And I remember uh, there was an, F-16 or what, I don't know what the planes are. It was a big military plane flying overhead and it was loud and it was low. And I thought, imagine what it must be like to be in Iraq or Afghanistan and not know whether that monster is going to drop a bomb on you. 
Um, but can I then say to myself, gee, I can imagine what that's like? Obviously, literary artists can. They inhabit other characters all the time. Um, but anyway, that's just uh, so. So for me, you know, what I try to do is just more find common ground where I can reach into somebody else uh, is easier for me than to say, oh, I, I can see things through their eyes. I wish I could. Uh, and maybe I'd have a different career if I could. Mm. Can you, do you feel that you can, um, you know, find them, but can, can, can see through their eyes or stand in their shoes? Yeah. I'm not saying a hundred percent in that. But in um, a meaningful yeah, way. it's uh, it's kind of like the question is how do we deepen empathy at a personal level? Right. So like a felt sense of empathy and, you know, there's a lot of uh, processes, you know, just kind of techniques like, you know, uh, uh, empathic listening or different em listening styles, you know, reflective listening. Um, I mean, I've done it in, in dance where, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, for me, there's kind of four parts to empathy. The first part is self-empathy. So it's kind of like mindfulness, awareness of what's going on within myself. So it's awareness uh, of my body body and and aware uh self-knowledge the other is like a mirrored empathy which is uh through mirror neurons if you've like looked at the whole you know science of mirror neurons that right. when we do an action and see an action the neurons fire in our brain so as i right. see you what's what's that the yawning chimpanzee the yawning chimpanzee and laughter and um the yawning is contagious and, and all that. So um, so just as we dialogue, that's what, one reason I like uh, Skype so much because you add that dimension of the uh, visual, which is so much more, uh, I can see, get so much oh. more of who you are. Then there's the perspective taking or kind of the imaginative, which is what you're kind of doing, really focusing on with the Afghan a Afghanis. Thing, wow, if I was in Afghanistan, this thing's flying over me, what would I feel like? You know, so you're kind of taking their perspective. And then uh, the fourth part is that empathic action where as we kind of connect and get to know each other, that we actually work together to uh, create something together. And that's kind of like what we need in the government, right? The government is fighting, fighting, fighting. How do we kind of use empathy to bring people together? So there's a mutual uh, creation of going forward where nobody feels left out, unheard, unseen. And uh, so that's kind of like the basic um, levels of empathy. And I, I've had all kinds of different experiences, you know, within that um, uh, model. Sometimes during the dance, you know, I've tried just really mirroring somebody, you know, just right. imitating what they do. And but with the intention of mirroring the person and saying, I really want to get who you are. I want to feel viscerally uh, who you are as a, as a being like because in every every emotion, every movement is a set of feelings. It's that delicious meal. Right. It's like right. all those flavors, each of those flavors. And right. um, so in the dance, it's kind of like tasting the flavors of the, who the person is. And through mirroring them, I found that something happens where you kind of click in and you become almost know who they are. And I'm, huh. I'm, we already know where they're going to move. Right. You know, it's you probably see it where you're really working in harmony with someone. And it's like, you can know in, in advance of where they're going to move and they know where you're going to move. And then I'll offer, a, you know, a different movement. And then they'll play with it. And so it becomes a very harmonious, you know, interactive. So I, I see that as kind of aspect. So, you know, the empathy, it, it gets a little more complicated as we look at the different, you know, parts right. of it. And, um, and I've seen that in conflict too, that once we kind of get to know each other, where I'll actually work together with someone and it has a very harmonious, you know, consideration. Oh, I know how they'll feel. They know how I feel. And and uh, so what did come to mind when you were talking about it is having the intention, you know, that one thing I, is to set the intention that for my life, I want to create more empathy. I want to live more empathically. 
because just like you're saying, it's it's a good meal. It tastes really good. I feel, you know, I feel better. I feel calmer. There's more oxytocin, more relaxation, less stress. You know, you live longer. Um, so there's all these benefits, you know, this just good feeling. And um, so that's kind of like the intention. And then to start working at it, you know, it's like, like anything, we need to kind of apply ourselves and look and learn and study it and try things out and, and kind of go forward. Um, so I, I guess that's, that's kind of how I'm seeing it now. And, and then I'm also seeing it in terms of transforming our society. And that's what kind of got me really excited about our dialogue is that's one of the areas because people like yourself are very, uh, the journalists are sensitive to listening, to hearing, to seeing. So there's already a, a, an interest in that. And how can we transform, you know, journalism so that it's, more supportive of, of empathy. Um, so yeah, those are, so I, I really, uh, you know, enjoy this whole conversation exploring this and, and especially you've given it a lot of thought too. Oh, well, no, thank you. It's been fascinating to uh, hear. I'd say one, you know, and I haven't done a study of this, but uh, you know, political leaders often uh, practice empathy by referring to the American myths, you know, the things, how we want to see ourselves, identifying themselves and their policies with that. But it's a way of connecting. We share these values. Uh, I would say that in 2008, uh, Obama was the first candidate that I can remember that truly practiced empathy. Um, uh, in almost every speech that he gave. And I actually tell my students about this. I say, go back and read some of the speeches because he oftentimes spends uh, the first, spent 30% of the speech in the beginning telling you what the other side thinks. I know where you, if you remember his speech on race even, he was saying, I understand why there's resentments. And he actually demonstrated that understanding. Um, and so I would say that, you know, it's a sad uh, reflection on our politics and our culture that he doesn't seem to do that anymore. That when he speaks, if you look at how he was campaigning before he became president and how he speaks now, that's almost completely disappeared. Yeah, uh, I, 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 have, uh, I was tracking that and I have a web page with about 60 of his speeches where he mentioned the importance of empathy. It was speeches, his book, interviews. I, you know, he said it's my most important value. He actually said, I'm running because I think I can contribute to creating more empathy, you know, within our society. And it was after the uh, Sotomayor um, nomination that he got really attacked uh, on empathy. And then he kind of pulled, I, pulled back on that. And um, so, I mean, there's so. The and the battle, and you want to win. I think probably part of it was like, too, he doesn't have to talk about empathy, but what he can say is, uh, I understand, uh, you know, why you're concerned about X, Y, or Z. I get why this is important to you. Let me tell you what the competing value is. Let me tell you how I haven't rejected everything you say, but have decided to give more weight to this factor rather than that. Yeah. And I mean, I think that if, politicians uh it could it, and the funny thing is is that you know whenever i watch those cnn focus groups while they do the debates or whatever whenever anybody's positive whenever they're empathetic that little line goes up 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 oh yeah uh-huh yeah, amazing uh -huh. and then when we attack it goes down 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 but somehow the attacks on some level work um and they're certainly easier it's a lot easier in 30 seconds to say why you know, your friend is a crook than to explain why your, why your opponent is a crook than it is to say how you came out in weighing competing values. Um, but I think modeling, you know, those, you know, modeling empathy for uh, whether it's politicians doing it or journalists doing it or parents doing it and remembering that my guess is you spend tons of time doing this and probably you catch yourself at some point going into old habits, right? I mean, you ever... I see it as a ongoing, you know, I'm just trying to learn to deepen it as well and see what's kind of involved is 
can talk to my partner. She says I'm the wrong person to be working on this, you know, because <laughs> she, uh, you know, she said, you're, you shouldn't be working on empathy. You don't have any empathy. <laughs> so anyway, we have, we're going to be having some men's groups too. So uh, around how men can develop empathy or deepen the empathy. I think it's there, you know, um, oh, yeah. you know, it, it's there. It's just how do we nurture it and foster it? And, you know, beforehand I had asked, you know, just your ideas about empathy, how to build a culture of empathy. You said, uh, one, make the argument that it's in our self-interest to practice empathy. Um, I think it's not so much self-interest as in it's part of our nature. So it's and it, and it makes us live more fulfilled lives and we are social animals. Right. So, um, but I would say that's in your self-interest to live a longer, happier, healthier life. Yeah, well, that's a more fulfilled. Yeah, that's a whole kind of question. I, I need. I have. I don't quite have the answer to that because there is this notion that we're selfish, greedy beings going right. out competing for our self-interest, and that can kind of happen through fear. But there is this other quality where it's not so much our self-interest that. Um, it's kind of like we have this capacity for empathy. It's kind of like the social glue that holds us together. And it's right. a little different. It's a little, it's, it's not quite, I mean, there's two different things going on. So um, it, it would be something to talk about more in the, the uh, future. But right. then the second point you had was demonstrate empathy uh, ourselves. That's embodying it and living it. And then demand empathy of others. Um, and that's kind of like, that's kind of what I kind of see. Nice what? In a nice way. In a nice way, yeah. It's like, I think that's a little bit of what I'm trying to do with the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy is say, hey, we need to make this a social value that let's, let's raise this up as a social value and kind of advocate, you know, for that and do it in an empathic way and, you know, empathically, you know, uh, advocate for it and if people don't want to then empathize with them why don't you want to do it and hear what it is you know why they're not wanting to do it so and, and you know i would say the other great advantage that we have is if you think that people are selfish and greedy look around you what have we built we built a society a civilization a culture. What are those? There's no individual that has their culture, their society, their civilization. I mean, it's what we've made together. We created a world for us to be with each other. Um, we have created things uh, that, uh, that, that, that allow us to interact with each other. Um, I, I think that there's certainly um, Ross Dohut, I think that's how you say his name, is Thomas from the New York Times, it had a column yesterday about this new Googleized technology that's allowing people to spend more time by themselves or whatever. The idea is that technology will isolate us more. And it's possible that people, you know, need their alone time too. Yeah. But nobody lives alone. Nobody doesn't want other people around them. If you do, you're kind of a sociopath. I mean, it's just people aren't like that. We have, a lot of times we, 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 we act out of greedy or selfish interest. And, and what happens is society focuses on that because that's a threat to the rest of us. And so kind of what we do is, you know, they study memory and uh, you remember the times when you messed up a lot more than you remember your successes. I'm, I remember the, the game senior year when I threw the ball into the outfield and we lost to our arch rival a lot more than I remember games I won. Uh, and I think that one thing to consider is that maybe we in society uh, uh, focus more on the selfish, greedy behavior of others, which might injure us, and then don't pay attention to the good stuff because, well, that's good. We take that for granted. Uh, I mean, I haven't done a study of that, but I would say that, you know, the mind focuses on, it, again, it's an efficient thing and it wants to devote its energy to things that are useful. So one of the things it devotes itself to is what's a threat to me? Yeah. You're being a nice, empathetic guy and all of that uh, is not a threat to me. Uh, so I will uh, maybe give that less of a priority in my mind. Then I got to watch out for the greedy jerks who are unpleasant. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know. 
And that's different from, you know, our air airwaves being, you know, filled with these extremists. Although actually that probably fits in too, because, you know, they're warning us about the other side. They're bad. They're evil. They don't share your values. They've got a war on women. They've got a war on taxes. They've got a war on drugs, on secure, whatever it is. Uh, and so, you know, maybe all of these natural movements that we have uh, get countered and amplified in a, uh, uh, the public discourse where the way you get attention on the things that people remember are the things that are warnings to them yeah. that might hurt them and that we, we don't give ourselves enough credit uh, for all the empathy that we uh, display. And I would remind you of the point I made earlier, which I thoroughly believe in, that we're a much nicer culture. And so we're, we're not quite as polite as we used to be. And politeness actually is a very good uh, groundwork for empathy. One of the things I love about NPR, besides the fact they have no commercials, which I hate, um, is the, the hosts are so polite. Somebody gives a report and they go, thank you. And they go, <laughs> you're welcome. And I mean, that's a little sign of dignity and, and respect towards somebody else that, uh, you know, is not as important in society as it once was. I'm glad to say here in the South, that's still drilled into people a little bit more. Um, and, and I think that politeness uh, is, is you're recognizing somebody else is there. It's a very small thing in, in some levels, but it's big. Yeah. Um, well, you're saying, it seems like you're saying that the kind of our awareness of fear, kind of we kind of are more, bring more awareness to fear and there might be empathy there, but we don't quite focus on it as much because the fear, uh, we're just kind of like wired maybe to be more conscious of the fear. Right. Uh -huh. We can get down on society a little bit more because the, the fear and the insults and the, uh, those sorts of things will stand out more. And I said there's probably a lot of goodness going on, uh, and we don't see it. Even people like us who sit around talking about this stuff uh, may not s recognize it in its fullness because I think the brain focuses more on uh, – Threats. Yeah, well, it could be the uh, our training too, and um, in the sense that I was talking when I talked to the Republican, those young Republicans, they were really talking about the fear. It's like, what's your most important value? Protection, which is all about addressing the fear by also, you know, by closing off, you know, fighting it, and you know, it's like. So we're really kind of talking about maybe how do we address fear? Do we, do we go, are we present with the fear? Do we empathize with the fears or do we fight the fears? You know, um, so. Yeah, I would empathize with the fear and I would rationalize it. And I think that people are way too fearful today. That guy who's like worried about his family probably live, probably doesn't lock his doors. When he leaves his home, he lives in such a safe neighborhood. I mean, what is your threat? I mean, that's another thing. What are you really concerned about? What's the issue? And that gets into a whole other thing. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of times when we talk about issues, uh, we're, we are talking about one thing, but we really mean something yeah. else. Uh -huh. um, I remember I did a story a few years ago about uh, the Confederate flag. And I had a lot of people call me up and say, oh, you know, you don't know what you're talking about with the flag. It's not hate. It's heritage, blah, blah, blah. Well, once I got kept them on the phone after a few minutes, they all knew that they all understood why it was offensive to other people. And their real beef was, why do I, as a white person, not get to fly my flag, but Al Sharpton gets to go off and say whatever he wants? Um, and not the rightness or wrongness about that, but their beef was not with, you know, was not just, oh, I'm going to fly the flag. And, and, and I don't know why anybody's offended. They understood that. Um, I think when you, you know, a lot of times the, uh, uh, which gets a, a, little, a little harder, but, you know, polls that show all these Republicans think uh, Obama's a Muslim. Uh, maybe a lot of them do. But I think probably a lot of them are just finding a way to say, I don't feel that he shares my values and it gets translated into something extreme like 
he's a Muslim. Yeah. Which I, uh, some of them believe. Similarly, you had polls, you know, in 2005 that showed that 35 or 40 percent of uh, Democrats polled thought that uh, 9-11 was an inside job and Bush knew about it and let it happen. Well, there's no doubt some of those people truly believe that. But I think 35 or 40 percent, probably a lot of them just felt like we're really trying to say, I don't trust that guy and I don't believe anything he says. And or or maybe... Maybe yeah, but, it's um, not feeling heard, and if people don't feel heard, they kind of speak louder, uh, right. get more extreme to be heard. Right. So the way to address it, and I see that one of the problems with progressives and the way they deal with conservatives, is they start uh, dismissing what conservatives right. say instead of getting closer and hearing more deeply because the more you dis we dismiss, the louder and more extreme uh, the, the voice gets so that they can be heard. Right. Um, so, That's an excellent point. Yeah. You, you, create, you create the monster that uh, you don't want to deal with. Yeah. If we, if we don't go to it and face, face the energy and hear it to the full extent. Um, right. And I think the other part, though, is, you know, you is to, I think it was like demand empathy of others. It's that I'm not just gonna go to you and hear you. It's we need to have everybody hear everybody else. Right. So it's kind of like demanding, it's almost like demanding a culture of empathy that this is what we want. Right. And it, it means I'm gonna hear you to the full extent that you need want to be heard, but I want to be heard as well. And we want to create an environment where that becomes the uh, norm and we find ways of structuring, you know, social structures that facilitate and deepen that. So, um, and, and really, you know what, to have more interesting conversations. I mean, when you practice empathy, the guy brings out his cell phone and tells you about the mother with the cancer. Yeah. You look oh. Interesting things instead of just tearing the same old, when you get into politics, you know, we start talking about that. What happens? You know, once I says the same thing you've heard from a hundred other people and vice versa, and nobody moves beyond that. Yeah. And then we start structuring things. And, and the other thing that I say to my students is, let's say you're a progressive and you think Republicans are crazy, stupid, and racist, okay? Well, talk to them. And you know what? After you talk to them, and after you hear what they have to say and you've done your level best, you may conclude they're crazy, stupid, and racist. It's, it's not as though, it, I think it, it doesn't prevent you from making judgments about things and people. In my, in my opinion, it doesn't. Um, uh, but I want to know why, okay? I want to know what somebody's like. Now, it's likely when you understand what their life experience is that you won't make those kind of judgments. But I'm saying, I, I don't know that we should define a, it's, a, it's a process. Mm -hmm. And where you come mm -hmm. out of it, it's up to you and how you make sense of things. Uh, you know, a suicide bomber. I, 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 it's hard for me to understand why someone would strap bombs on themselves and go to a bazaar and kill a bunch of women and children. Uh, but I want to talk to that person and ask, what. Well, the world, what brought you to this point? Obviously, I've talked to them before they do that. And then after the interview, I will call the police and say, arrest this guy. But, but I mean, the point is, you don't have to, it's not saying to understand is not to agree with or to You're apologize. Right. Uh -huh. It's Empathy to is say, not, uh -huh. I want to know. Because you have reasons that you think are good. And I have reasons that I think are good. And that's where humility comes from. You know, and a lot of it, you can stress, you can go back to the religious faiths. What did they do? They try to teach us humility decency, respect, humility, especially in what you were saying about empathy before, is I'm going to fall short, right? I mean, every Christian, it's like you're a sinner. You're not going to be perfect. And we too often in discourse, when we talk about religion and Christians in particular, it's like, oh, you see, they're a bunch of phonies because uh, they did X or Y, and, and that's not what the Bible says. Nobody expects people to, to be Jesus. He was Jesus, you know, but what we want to do is try to be better, is to try to get something, whether it's through empathy or religious faith or it's a skill that you have, whatever it is, you know, to say, I'm flawed. I'm not always going to do what I want to do, but I'm at least going to set a level, a bar, 
of something to move towards. And the beauty of the goal, actually, the best goals are ones that you probably never achieve because that's how hard it is. But that's how good it is. Well, this has uh, been a lot of fun and um, really explored a lot of great uh, topics here. Uh, so I'm really glad to, you know, that I found your article and had a chance to talk and uh, maybe we can find some other topics that, you know, be more specific. Because there's so many, like, uh, I could just keep bringing them up and up and up here. Uh, but we've gone for about an hour and 15 minutes. So, um, oh, no, it's been she... absolutely wonderful. And it's been unbelievably stimulating to me. Again, this is, I opened this up. This is why I got into the business is because I get to speak with really smart, engaged people about the things that they know best. And, uh, I learn a lot. You know, you learn both about the subject matter of the person, but you're also inspired by people who see themselves as being on a journey, who, who want to get somewhere. And when you are come in contact with somebody like that, you can't help at least for a little while. It's like, you know, you listen to Mozart and your IQ is raised for eight minutes afterwards. Uh -huh. so that's why I got to keep talking to people like you because it like lasts for a little bit. And then I go back to my old self, and then I talk to somebody else again. And I'm inspired, and but hopefully, each step I get there's a little increment. So you're you're going to help me be, you know, incrementally one, well, one quarter one percent better. Well, for my life. metaphor for empathy it's like a cornucopia. So as I talk to you, I get the cornucopia of your experience, you know, and then talking to other people, their cornucopia. So it does enrich our lives, I, I think. And that's been my experience. So, well, I better uh, end this, or I, yes. I keep feeling like there's more things I can talk oh, about. Oh, yeah, no. Well, <laughs> well, but we we, let's, pick it, up, let's I, pick it up. Let's pick it up at another point in time. Do me another hour on, on something. We'll kind of arrange it by uh, email. And Absolutely. So. I would love to do that. But I, I really, it's a, been a pleasure. And thank you so much for uh, inviting me to do this. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.